This is James Randi, and you're listening to The Skeptic Zone. The Skeptic Zone, a miracle of technology. A universe of reason, the Skeptic Zone. Hello, and welcome to The Skeptic Zone, show number 46 for the 4th of September 2009. Richard Saunders here with you from Sydney, Australia, and through the paranormal magic of the supernatural, I'm also at DragonCon Atlanta, USA. It's either the paranormal magic of the supernatural or the fact that I'm recording this earlier than the show's going out. Look, you decide. It's one or the other. But we're having a great time at DragonCon, Dr. Reggie, Kylie Sturgis and I, and we're getting some good interviews. Look out for those coming up over the next few weeks. And while you're waiting for those, I'll bring your attention to a new website, grassrootsskeptics.org. To quote the press release, press release, these skeptics are getting serious. There are a lot of passionate advocates and community groups working diligently to advance critical thinking, said Grassroots Skeptics founder K.O. Myers. We want to help increase their effectiveness by making it easier for them to find new members, share resources, and identify methods for getting their message out. So, why not check them out? HTTP colon slash slash grassrootsskeptics.org And while you're surfing around the internet, check out a new Blip TV channel I've come across called Quack TV. HTTP colon slash slash quacktv.blip.tv And so to this week's episode of The Skeptic Zone. It really should be called the Iran Sagev Skeptic Zone this week. Iran Sagev interviews Queensland skeptic Margaret Kitson. She talks about her life in skepticism and about the upcoming Australian Skeptics National Convention in Brisbane, Queensland. That'll be in November. That's followed by A Grain of Salt with Iran Sagev. Oh well, sounds like an interesting show to me. Let's get into it. Margaret Kitson is a teacher, a librarian, and a long-time skeptic. She's currently the secretary of Queensland Skeptics and is involved in the organization of the 2009 Skeptics Convention, which will be held in Brisbane. I called Margaret to hear about her life, skepticism, and, of course, the convention. Hello, Margaret, and welcome to the Skeptic Zone. Hello, Iran. It's lovely to be talking to you on what is a beautiful, beautiful Sunday in Brisbane. It's also beautiful in Sydney, and we really should be outside rather than locked inside on the computer, don't you think? I think so. I think so. And I'm just really, really hoping that at the end of the year, when the Australian Skeptics National Convention comes to Brisbane for the first time since 2001, that we have wonderful weather end of spring hopefully it'll be really nice and not too hot i hope so too <laughs> um now margaret let's let i want to talk to you about yourself first yes you've okay. been involved with the skeptics for a very long time i Tell have when you first become involved with the skeptics Okay, my first connection with the skeptics came when I was teaching at a school in Darwin and I saw a copy of the magazine and in in a library at a school that I was working at. And I looked at it because what jumped out at me was the front cover, which had a wonderful cartoon dealing with creation science. And earlier in my life, in my professional career, I'd had some encounters with creation scientists and I became a bit of an oxymoron, you straight do. away. Yes, an oxymoron indeed, that creation and science don't belong in the same sentence together. So that was when I became, became a subscriber. Around about 2000, I went to my first convention, which was the biggie that was held in Sydney, the three-day, which there were sceptical luminaries from all around the world, which came to that poor Kurtz. James Randi made a special guest appearance, Um, Joe Nicholl and Richard Wiseman. um, I really can't remember them all. It was absolutely an amazing event. So that was when I became a conference junkie. And I've been to just about every single one since then. 
I went to TAM5, the amazing meeting. I went to the one of those in January 2007 in Las Vegas. You mentioned that your first involvement with the skeptics was had something to do with the creation scientists, so-called creation yeah. scientists. Can you elaborate on that and how that attracted you? Okay, as I said, that was why I became a subscriber to the magazine. Back in the 1970s, um, I was teaching at a high school in the northern suburbs of Brisbane, and we had a very interesting political situation back in those days where certain people of certain religious persuasions had a, a real in with the certain people within the government which meant that it was the only time, fortunately, that the creation science movement had a lot of traction politically. This particular school that I was working at, I was working as a teacher librarian. And one of the things that you have to do as a teacher librarian was to catalogue books. And I had a staff member who sadly was the head of science come into me with some books on creation science. It was my first encounter with any of the literature that was published by um, people with this particular agenda and told me that I needed to catalogue books in the 500s and the 570s, which is the Dewey Decimal Number for Life Sciences, so that they sat next to evolution. And here was a head of science who should have known better telling me, a humanities graduate, that this stuff was science and it had to sit on the shelf next to science. My argument to him was that, no, it's not a science. It's actually a religious theory. So, therefore, it belongs somewhere in the 200s, which was where those books, anything on creation, the correct number for it's at 213 because that's the number for it. So, um, is, that, um, we, is that myths and legends? No, myths and legends <laughs> tend to end up somewhere else. 200's the 100 division in Dewey for religions. Okay. And um, we ended up having a couple of real set twos where I spoke my mind and he spoke his in the workroom in this particular library and I stuck to my guns. But there was quite a lot of interference at that stage. The Year 9 Science Program in Queensland Schools there was the expectation that the two models actually be taught, evolution and creation, that that was, and it was the old equal time argument. And I suppose that was when I started to think, what is creation science all about and why do I have a huge problem with it? Now, I don't have a science background, but I do have a history background and I do have a background in ancient history. I've taught senior ancient history for a number of years and do know um, that, that area of history reasonably well. One of the things that you do learn is that the story of Noah, as, come, as written up in the book of Genesis in the Bible, isn't even original. It's an adaptation from a much earlier story that's in a... In a very, very early document called the Epic of Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh, in one part, goes off to meet this fellow called Utnapishtum, who's supposedly got the secret uh, of eternal life. And Utnapishtum, in the Babylonian version, was the original Noah. And then there's an even earlier Sumerian version back even further that's been found. So I'm taking the Bible as literal fact and being able to say that it's science, I know from my professional expertise is absolute nonsense. Um, and that's one thing that I've learnt in the meantime is about the scientific method, that one of the great things when you get a scientific theory is that you get convergence of evidence, evidence coming from lots of different sources that all end up pointing to the same conclusion. And that's certainly the case with creation science, that you don't need to be a scientist to be able to turn around and say, I'm sorry, it's bollocks. If you've got an understanding of history and how stories start and where they come from and how people um, adopt them and then move with them, you realise that the stories in the Old Testament are lifted from earlier versions. There's some, you know, new bits and pieces. But um, to say that the, that the Bible and the book of Genesis is fact is, is nonsense. Um, and it should, doesn't have any time in science. So that was why I was passionate about 
it to start with. And it's been, to use the term, an evolution of my scepticism in the meantime. I didn't necessarily realise that there were other people out there that had similar um, thought processes to me and it's been lovely in the intervening time to meet up with members of, of the sceptical community. I've really, really enjoyed it and it's all down to creation science is the reason it was the hook that got me on board way back in the 1970s. Praise the Lord. Yes. Um, no. <laughs> Hallelujah. No, I, I wanted to ask you about, you mentioned that evolution of skeptic, skeptical thought in you, yeah. but it's quite obvious from what you're telling that you'd been a skeptic before you knew there was a skeptical movement because you, yeah. before you became involved with the skeptical yeah. movement. Yes. Can you maybe describe how that happened, how when you found out that you had skeptical inclinations when you were able to actually define it yourself? I, okay, we'll have to go back very much earlier. Um, my family, even though I'm a fourth-generation Australian, my family's heritage, cultural heritage, is Irish Catholic, which meant that I went to the Catholic school um, where you hear all the really neat stories. I thoroughly enjoyed doing most of the stuff. The First Holy Communion and all of that sort of stuff was great fun. Confession really bothered me. Um, but that's for different reasons. And I suppose it was finally when I was in grade five, because we're, we're looking at pre-Vatican II here. So this is around about 1960 when there was still the Latin Mass, where Pope Pius XII was still the Pope, um, where the power and control was still very much there, where you were continually being told that, you know, you are so lucky that you have the one true faith. And we used to have this prayer at the end of Mass called the Prayer for the Conversion of Russia, which I used to hear every Sunday morning. And I, and I started to wonder, I wonder if the children sitting in the classrooms in Moscow, the godless atheists, whether they have something equivalent to say that they don't believe in things like this and then from there going on further because I've always loved history and stories from history um, you learn a lot about the human condition through studying history and reading stories and you discover at the end of the day that human nature hasn't really changed very much over time um, I started to think well you know all of these religions thought they were right um, and what makes this one special um, and from there, basically, the only reason I can see is you, that you can come to is that you have to take, I can't remember whether it, was, whether it was Augustine or Aquinas said, a leap of faith. You have to want to believe in it and then you backward map to say here's the evidence. And that was the step that I fell down on. I, I'm afraid that I couldn't accept that, that I couldn't see that there was any evidence to accept the fact that this particular story was any truer in a literal sense that had the evidence with it than any other story. Um, but being 10 years old and a girl in that kind of environment, you didn't, you learnt not necessarily to speak your mind, or if you did speak your mind, you ended up expecting put downs because I did get very, very heavily put down. Um, by various people. I must say that I'm extremely fond of most of the nuns who taught me because a lot of them were very, very good human beings and I'm very, very fond of both my parents. So you have this mismatch where you don't know what what I believe is at odds with what these people whom I love, respect, admire and who are good people are telling me. So you tend, particularly when you're at that age and you don't necessarily have the confidence to advocate for what you believe in. You tend to sort of just leave it in the background and you learn not to talk about it. So I suppose that's what I ended up doing through the rest of my school career and also to a great degree at university when I finally decided, I suppose, around about the age of 19 that no, I really don't think there's very much in this for me anymore. I'm having a very hard time accepting what's being told to me and I just basically walked away. Um, didn't really walk to anything, I must admit, 
and that was why I suppose when when I did finally start doing some reading, so that was the genesis of Margaret, sort of heading down that direction. <laughs> right, yeah. it's a case yeah. of not so, knowing what you aren't rather than knowing what you are. So you started with the genesis, then you had the revelation. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, yes. I won't say anything about that. No, no, well, I mean, a metaphor is a metaphor, and sometimes ab- it's just a metaphor. <laughs> absolutely, I have no problem with that. I, I say, oh, God, and yes. stuff like that all the time. Yeah. Now, you're a teacher and a librarian. Do you, yes. do you still teach? I am still teaching. I've had a career change well, about seven years ago. I spent a lot of my teaching career teaching English and history in high schools, which I absolutely adored. I love teaching. I would still really enjoyed it. And I, I really enjoyed teaching teenagers too. What's chased me and so many of my other colleagues out of the classroom are the increasing layers of accountability and the paperwork that we get thrust upon us from outside and which takes us away from doing what is essentially our core business. I have no problem with the issue of accountability um, that's fair enough. But the, how many times can you count something? That's the thing that stri- drove me nuts. Um, my last year teaching, I had a 10, 11 and 12 English class and 11 and 12 ancient history. And I was pulling on occasion, particularly at the end of term when you had to get marking done and generate reports and things like that. It wasn't unusual for me to work a 70 or an 80 hour week. Um, and it, at the end end of it, I just ran out of energy. Teaching does, to do it well, you've got to care about it. And that draws on emotional reserves where you are, are actually up in front of a class performing or engaging with kids and helping them learn. That takes a lot out of you. And at the end of it, I was very, very pleased Um, because as I said, I'd always loved stories and books, that I was able to get some teacher librarian qualification and then some library science qualification, go into teacher librarianship and then get very, very lucky and become a teacher librarian in a primary school. That means that I run a primary school library in one of Brisbane's leafy suburb. I've got 740 lovely children who come, borrow books and read. I've got a great staff and I really enjoy my life as it is at the moment. Um, I could not be a primary classroom teacher. I look at my colleagues in stunned admiration, particularly the ones with the early years people, because I really do not know how they do what they do. They often look at me and say, I don't know how you ever taught high school, but I really love what I'm doing because I'm passionate about stories. I'm passionate about sharing stories with children and the importance of stories just fire up kids' imaginations. The one thing, we have this thing in Queensland called the Queensland Core Core Skills Test, which is done about halfway through Year 12, our final high school year. And the best indicator that they've been able to find for children who do well, I shouldn't say children at that stage, for people to do well in that is wider reading. That's the, that's the, the key thing that they've been able to correlate with successful outcomes, that the kids that get the really good scores that then go on to university, the one thing they all have in common is wider reading, or or a lot of them have in common. So that's one thing that I'm really excited about, particularly with the building the education revolution money, the money going into schools um, for libraries and things like that, because I think that's really, really a key plank in education. Do you ever take your scepticism to class? Do you ever teach scepticism or teach critical thinking or somehow convey the message of scepticism or critical thinking to children in class? Yes, you do, because you do get to, to, to children to seek the evidence that that's really, really important. Um, and, and you can do it to a degree in literature. I mean, there's certain tools of scepticism that you can... Because scepticism is essentially a process. It's not a belief... A, 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 a belief position, um, so to speak. I think that's one reason I like it because it is a process. It's a way of looking at the world like science and scientific methods a process. It's not a belief position in the same way as being, you know, even a 
up here a Broncos supporter or a Lions supporter or, or whatever sporting team. It's, it's not – or even preferring one political party over another. Um, and that's one thing, that the principles of scepticism are ones that you incorporate into your teaching all the time. All the good teachers do. The importance within your subjects of seeking the evidence, what's evidence in this particular discipline. You make a hypothesis – how do you find evidence? And to call thing, things which ain't so, they aren't so. What's the problem with this one? Um, is that based on a false premise? Can you believe what this person is speaking? Let's track, track stuff to its source. Um, that's one thing that I really wish would get profiled a lot more is history because there's a lot of sceptical steps in history um, that I think people on the science side tend to rather despise humanities people and say, you know, you, you're not, you don't think critically and um, I, I really do. I'm just trying to think of a good example. Um, okay, there is a wonderful urban legends webpage called snopes.com which I have occasionally shown to students, particularly if they come down with an urban legend and really like it. So we go online and we have a look at it and say, okay, what's the urban legend? Um, there was one that I, I went through with some year seven kids a few years ago. It was one about Michael J Jackson hanging the kid out the window. And let's go somewhere. What's a reliable source? We'll go to Snopes. We'll have a look at it. And this is because it deals with urban legends. And the reason Snopes is good is that it does take you back to the sources. It evaluates a site as true or false or unproven. And then at the end, it's got a whole heap of um, references to show where things come from. So in my position, uh, because resourcing the curriculum is a key element of what I do, um, apart from promoting stories, it's the other key, key, key element to my role. Um, yes, to making making sure that, that what's in the collection is relevant and up-to-date. So, yes, it's as I said, it's a process. It sits behind um, you the whole time and, and manifests occasionally rather than being something that you teach as a formal subject. I mean, it's as I said, it's a process, so it's... I do use the tools of scepticism a lot in in what I do in my engagements with my colleagues and also with um, the children. The biggie yeah, well, that I had. It's. it's uh, I think we skeptics generally are aware that critical thinking and skepticism are not about science or about yeah. any specific topic, and it is something that per pervades um, that is pervasive and, and permeates all of all of life. Yeah. Um, there is one thing where I did butt heads with my school administration, whom I normally get on very well with, I must add, um, that we ended up with some awful rubbish PD a couple of years ago um, that suddenly emerged on our professional development calendar. Uh, a dodgy Sorry, PD product. PD for those who are not teachers? Uh, professional development PD, professional development calendar. A few years ago, in February 2006, I sat at the sat in a staff room with my colleagues, listening to speakers talk about some flim flam by the name of Brain Gym, and the most appalling nonsense was being peddled out, and everybody just sat there and copped it, and I made a huge mistake. I challenged the speaker, was rather rude, got spoken to the next day by my principal, as he had the right to do because I had been rude, but I refused to resolve from the position that what we were listening to was absolute rubbish and that we shouldn't have been forced to, to um, listen to it. I think the problem was that from the point of view of teachers as classroom practitioners, they were just interested in finding some clues that would help them teach. That, and they didn't really care to hoots about what was behind it. That brain gym is some fun exercises that you can do with your kids while they're basically sitting in their chairs or standing in their place. So any activity that you can use to engage kids is great. That's fine. What I had the problem with was the pseudoscience that was behind it. 
and I very much doubt whether the rest of my colleagues, got primary school, nobody that are really science specialists there, sadly, and, and that is an issue, a different issue, um, probably weren't even paying any attention to the rest of the nonsense that this presenter was going out with. It was also an extremely hot day in February. It was after school. Um, we were probably sitting in a room with about that was at about 35 degrees and no air conditioning and very, very humid. So the rest of it, we were probably were just practising selective listening. But um, that was one that I have kept plugging away at and I hope that I've won some people in the middle. There are obviously the true believers that accept all of the augment nonsense that gets peddled out and toddle off to their chiropractors and their naturopaths. Um, but hopefully the ones in the middle, I hope I did get through to. I do know I got through to a couple of people because I got feedback afterwards about it. Um, so that was one example of where I actually did get very missionary as far as scepticism is concerned with mixed results. Um, I would use different tactics in future other than the ones that I used at that time. And that's what you should all do, we should all do we make a mistake we learn from it we take it on board and think well I won't go there next time I'll try to get the same outcome but that methodology didn't work let's try something different this time around and keep if on I, doing it if I may comment specifically about that thing about being rude or how you yeah. how we approach yeah. people who peddle all yeah. kinds of nonsense I found that obviously being polite and being friendly always helps it makes you look more more approachable. It makes your yeah. the position that you're pushing more approachable. Yeah. yeah. The problem is that sometimes it's very very difficult yes. to be polite. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so I completely understand where you're coming from. But yeah. as you said, you make mistakes and you learn from them. Now yeah. I'd like to move uh, to to move again back to speaking about the skeptics. And yeah. you are currently the secretary of the Queensland Skeptics. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And you also have uh, another role. Would you like to speak about that as well? Okay, the other role is the convener for Bruce Skepticon. Is that the one that you mean? That's the Iran? one. I mean. Okay, Bruce Skepticon is the nickname that I've given to this year's Australian Skeptics National Convention, which is being held at, in beautiful Brisbane in the last weekend of November um, this year. That's the 27th, 28th, and 29th of November. Um, after having been a convention junkie, basically since 2000, I thought that it was about time that two things happened. Number one, that a convention come back to Brisbane because there hasn't been a national convention held here since 2001. And also um, that I'd like to use all of the experience that I've gained in attending all of these other conventions um, to have a go at running it. Um, to organising it. So last year I decided to put up my hand and volunteer my services to do so. And basically since then I've had a lot of fun um, getting it all organised. And I'm pleased to say that things look as though they're coming together really, really well. The I've um, had some fantastic help with some wonderful people in Brisbane who uh, Peter Ellison in particular I'd like to mention he was last year's Australian Skeptics winner of the Australian Skeptics Prize for Critical Thinking last year and he has set us up a Queensland Skeptics website at just qldskeptics.com where amongst other things all of the program information and other information about the convention is loaded including information about our guest speakers. We've been very, very lucky to attract um, a couple of really high profile guest speakers. It's a bit of a combo of, of Margaret's vision, some people that I really think that I'd like the rest of my sceptical colleagues to listen to and also um, some old favourites and some Brisbane locals. So a real combination but I suppose two key themes. Um, science, science is important. As sceptics we have a, a commitment to critical thinking and the scientific method so I'm wanting to focus on science 
and the Saturday program is looking into science-based things and the Sunday program, the focus is changing just a bit to, to use the phrase I think first coined by Michael Shermer, why people believe things, weird things. Um, the focus is going more onto the nature of belief and why people accept things which just aren't so. Um, the theme of the convention is myth and myth's conception because all evidence is not equal. We've got Dr. Carl Kruselnicki kicking the show off on the Monday morning. Um, we're very lucky to get Carl's services and he's keeping with that theme, um, talking about a whole heap of misconceptions. And on Sunday, the other person that I've got, that I've gone out and chased, that I really wanted people to hear, is Associate, Associate Professor Tony Taylor from Monash University. Um, I was in Melbourne in February and I picked up a book after I read a review in The Age called History Betrayed, um, and I was so impressed with the review that I went out and bought a copy straight away and thought, wow, I want everybody to be aware of what this, what this gentleman's talking about. Um, and his title of his talk is The Art and Craft of Pseudo-History. Um, Denial History Betrayed is actually a study of the ideology and the psychology of historical denial in modern history. Um, that he really wanted to get into the pathology of that and what lies behind it and why people um, and it can and can be a con cultural thing why can't we get our heads around the fact that these things happened um, so I'm really looking forward to the opportunity for people to listen to Tony and he's been really really helpful um, I'm really looking forward to meeting up with the gentleman and we've got some other wonderful locals, we've got Loretta Marin, the jelly bean lady who featured on A Current Affair earlier this year exposing a cancer quack up in Mackay. Um, we've got other people who have um, experience with, I suppose, the effects of what happens when people believe um, alt-med nonsense. And we've got some old tried and true ones as well. So... Um, that's a quick snapshot of what's in the program and um, I am really looking forward to it and catching up with everyone. Margaret, uh, uh, to end um, this um, wonderful chat, can you please tell us again where more information can be found about the convention? Okay. Um, the Australian Skeptics website has got a link um, on the right-hand side of its home page, or you can go straight to the Queensland Skeptics website, which is www.queenslandskeptics.com. It's been wonderful talking to you, Margaret. Thank you very much for being on the Skeptic Zone, Margaret Kids. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Examining the truth and exposing the frauds, badpsychics.co.uk is the website that critically examines mediums, clairvoyance and psychics. Follow the controversies, news and discussions in the lively forum community. And now you can download your weekly fix of Righteous Indignation, the official podcast of badpsychics.co.uk that talks hard and critically about the paranormal. Badpsychics.co.uk, the UK's largest and most respected sceptical site looking at psychics. This is Brian Dunning from the Skeptoid Podcast. Been enjoying your critical thinking shows in audio only? <laughs> You've been missing half the fun. Check out my new video podcast, In Fact, on iTunes or click it on Skeptoid.com. Three pilot episodes of In Fact are available now for immediate viewing. I'm looking for sponsorship to produce an entire first season of 13 episodes, and hopefully many more seasons to follow. You can see the whole lineup and get all the other nuts and bolts if you go to Skeptoid.com and click on In Fact. And don't forget to come back to the Skeptic Zone when you're done watching. I, I think it's audio only, <laughs> but that's okay, I still like it. This is Brian Dunning from Skeptoid.com. Grain of salt, grain of salt, grain of salt, grain of salt.
Let's all take this with a grain of salt. Here's Iran Seged. One of the least talked about aspects of medical science is its heavy reliance on statistics. It is known to doctors and scientists in the field, of course, and I suspect many people have some vague notion that statistics is being used, but very few people understand what it really means and how it may affect them. The urge to talk about this topic right now is mostly due to our recent campaign against the AVN and Meryl Dory's foolish statement that we should not treat kids with an intervention that is not 100% safe. But the expectation that medicine should be as safe as that has been troubling me for a while. People clearly don't realize just how foolish that expectation is. It's not that people shouldn't expect a high level of safety in their medical treatment. They absolutely should. And for a treatment to be approved for general use, it must pass stringent tests, not only for efficacy, but also for safety. But safety is also relative to the effect. For example, chemotherapy drugs are extremely toxic. Many of them are even carcinogenic in their own right, yet cancer patients get them because on balance they do more good than harm. You could refuse to take chemo on the grounds that it's not 100% safe, but then you die of cancer. Even benign drugs like paracetamol can and do have side effects, but on balance they're worth using. So it's always about weighing up the pros and cons and associated probabilities. Expecting 100% safety or 100% efficacy is foolish. Unfortunately, it's not only foolish, it is also harmful. And it's harmful for two main reasons. One is that people refrain from using certain treatments. The best known example is vaccines, which have extraordinary safety and efficacy records, yet some people choose not to vaccinate their children because they are not 100% safe, or whatever other lies the AVN tells them about vaccines. What they do not realize is that they are placing their children at much higher risk of contracting the disease. Of course, a lot of children are protected by herd immunity, but where the propaganda machine of the anti-vaccination lobby has done its work, there is no herd immunity and children get sick. The other reason that expecting 100% efficacy or safety is harmful is more complex. It has to do with expectations and how people treat failure in medical treatment. Because of the high success rate of most modern medical treatments and the well-established human weakness in understanding probabilities, when a doctor says to a patient that a procedure has, say, a 90% success rate, the patient naturally expects to be in the much larger group when, as inevitably happens, 10% of the patients find themselves on the side of failure, many, if not most of them, do not take this too well. What very often results is the demand for compensation. I'll elaborate on the effects of the demand for compensation later, but I want to talk first about the saying, when it happens to you, it's 100%. Of course, that statement is true in a sense, but that does not mean that we have to accept it as a society. Counter to many people's view, Society does put a price on things such as human life and well-being. No society will save a life at any cost, and only so much money is spent on things like improving road safety, because the cost of reducing road deaths would make driving cars unrealistically expensive. So as a society, we decided that a certain number of deaths per year is an acceptable price to pay for affordable transportation. Now, of course, for each of the dead and maimed and their families, the price is unacceptable, Yet we rarely hear families of road accident victims demand that we make all roads dual lane, fully separated roads with a technologically enforced speed limit of 50 km per hour. The reason is that even those affected realize the implications are unacceptable. With medicine, people often do not take the same approach. The reason is not clear to me, but it could be because people know a lot less about how medicine works than they do about road safety. It could also be because in medicine there is almost invariably someone to blame, as there are medical professionals involved. Whatever the case may be, it can generally be said that people are much more willing to use the statement, when it happens to you it's 100%, when discussing medical risk than when they discuss other risks. Basically, there is a different standard for medicine, and it's a much harsher one. That harsher standard also manifests itself in statements like, 18,000 people a year die due to medical errors. I will not venture to dispute the statistical figure. I will, for the sake of this talk, assume that it is accurate. The question that must be asked is this. Of the 18,000 people, how many would have died with no medical intervention at all? 
As most of the information is based on estimates, it is difficult to know for sure. But I have done a little bit of research, and it seems a large majority of those whose death is attributed to medical error died due to failure to provide appropriate medical treatment. Only a small minority died due to commission rather than omission. And even in those cases, it is not clear how they would have fared with no medical treatment at all. It is very rare indeed for someone to come to, into a hospital with a non-life-threatening condition and end up dead. Actual cases of real negligence are very rare too. So next time proponents of alternative medicine quote that figure, ask them these questions. 1. How many people has medicine saved this year? Hint, a lot more than 18,000. 2. How many of the 18,000 would have died without any treatment? 3. What was the life expectancy in China before scientific medicine, and what is it now? I referred earlier to the compensation demands and their effects. Doctors in the West pay huge amounts of money to insurance companies. They pay those amounts because despite the overall rate of success being very high, and despite the fact that failure is not only expected, it is inevitable, those few cases of failure are likely to see compensation, and often win very significant amounts. An obstetrician I spoke to some time ago said his insurance policy cost more than $100,000 a year. I'll let that sink in for a moment. $100,000 per year. There are not many Australians who earn that much, yet a successful obstetrician pays this exorbitant amount because he will inevitably be sued, and the question is only how much he will have to pay. From an actuary perspective, it is a wonder that he can get any insurance at all. The result is that this successful and experienced doctor is av available to only a very small minority of patients who can pay the fees that are required to cover the insurance. The doctor ha also has to work privately as much as possible to finance this and other costs, so will try to work as little as possible in the public system. I believe the harm caused to society by cases such as this is obvious. If we go back to vaccines, it's worth pointing out that vaccines are not, and cannot be, 100% safe. The AVN make that statement as if it's some kind of conspiracy or secret, but it's nothing of the sort. Information about risks and side effects is publicly available, but what it shows is that vaccines are so extremely safe that any concerns raised by the anti-vaccine lobby are baseless. Personal anecdotes are used to provide an angle similar to the when it happens to you it's 100% thing, but that is not how medicine works. It works by using statistics on large numbers. Meryl Dory, for example, claims that her son was injured by vaccines. How does she know that? Well, she just does. And she does, because she's as knowledgeable about statistics as she is about just science in general, which is not at all. Like many people, she confuses correlation with causation. I, being an atheist and therefore completely lacking any moral compass, decided to carry out an experiment, and after my first son turned out to be on the autistic spectrum, I decided to scientifically test the hypothesis that vaccines cause autism. I recruited my second son, and then the third, to the experiment and subjected all three to the full schedule of vaccines. Based on this experiment, with n equals 3, I can say that vaccines cause autism in one-third of all children, or perhaps in one-third of all boys, or, or perhaps in just one-third of all my boys. Incidentally, vaccines also cause short-sightedness in one-third of boys, and asthma in a third of boys. Surprisingly, vaccines do not cause any two of these in any one child. Jokes aside, the only way to find out what is really happening is using statistics, which is what was done in a large number of real studies with real controls and proper statistics. And they show that vaccines do not cause autism and are generally extremely safe except for people with some very specific and very rare genetic conditions. Society would be much better off if people realized how important statistics is in medicine, how it makes the difference between useful and unuseful treatments, and that 100% is not a realistic expectation for the efficacy or safety of any treatment. Before deciding on medical treatment, people should ask their doctors about the statistics related to the proposed treatment. They should remember not to expect 100% safety or efficacy, and that they may end up being on the wrong side of statistics. Those who consider such risks to be unacceptable should look at other activities in their lives, such as driving cars, and realize that we all accept risks every day of our lives when we consider the probability of things going well to be good enough, but rarely 100%.
Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. Over the next weeks, we'll be bringing you those interviews from DragonCon. Until then, you might want to check out the website of Australian Skeptics, www.skeptics.com.au. And once you're there, if you click the link at the top of the page that says Resources, you'll find the new Videos page. Lots of videos there, including James Randi in Australia. And you'll see why, or one of the reasons why, the Australian Skeptics kicked off in 1980. So, until next week, or possibly the week after, hmm, depends how I feel after getting home with jet lag, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia, and Atlanta, USA. You've been listening to The Skeptic Zone. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for comments, contacts, and extra video reports. Let's get six on